Hey, have you ever seen a rat king? The water was right below our knees. We were sitting at the edge of the dock, jeans pulled up right above our kneecaps so they wouldn't get wet. We knew as well as anyone that water would soak through the underside, causing an uncomfortable feeling once we rolled the jeans back out to their full length. Lori had his cap pulled down enough so that he could safely squint at the sun. No sight was obscured that afternoon on the lake. A rat king? I asked Lori. He stared at me. He had these big green eyes with dark circles around them, black and purple like an exhausted raccoon. I've heard of one, but I thought it was just a myth. Have you seen one? He grinned. Yeah, yesterday. He said. I tried to take him seriously, but my mouth betrayed me, twisting up tight enough until my teeth split through, muffling my laughter. That's bull, I said through my giggles. Lori huffed and looked back out at the water. The various sailboats owned by the rich families on the west side of town skidded across the water, leaving glimmers of silver sunlight in their wake. They weaved in between the buoys that marked the limit of their travel, but they could obviously afford to pass them. Lori and I, along with several of our friends, weren't from families that could afford sailboats, much less than weave in between buoys like that. But we still had plenty of fun. Lori had this game where he would throw rocks at the sailboats from the bushes. The object of the game was to throw as many rocks as you could without getting caught. He ran his tongue across his teeth and carefully examined the rock in his hand. I really did, honestly, he pressed. Last night. I went down the manhole opening by my house, and I was walking around the sewer and I saw one. There were, like, seven rats in there. Four toilers. I cocked my head. Toilers? I asked. Lori scoffed and eyed me. Oh, now you're curious? I jabbed him in the shoulder. He laughed a little. Okay, all right. There's a specific hierarchy in a rat king system. Obviously, it's a bunch of rats that have their tails tangled together until they're just a hulking mass of rodent. But, you know, it's more nuanced than that. First, there's the king himself. He's the biggest rat with the strongest tail, the root of the tangle. He bears the weight that everyone else has to pull, and they put up with it because they know he could kill them, like, instantly. Then, after him, there's the heir. The heir is a pretty small, delicate rat, but it's favored by the king. It doesn't have to do much work to pull itself or anyone else around. Sometimes, the king even carries it on his back. Then, after the heir, there's the oracle. The oracle is the runt, the weak one. However, since it's so weak, it's had to harden itself to survive and learn to work with its cunning and reason. That way, it can silently guide the other rats safely. The oracle is usually the only reason a rat king can survive, but it can't have any crutches or comfort. That ruins the integrity. I blinked. His knuckles were white against the rock, hands perfectly still as he waited in his concentration. He clearly had given this topic a lot of thought, and I wasn't about to knock him for that. He had to put up with me talking about my stupid interests, so I could deal with him discussing how a rat monarchy works. So, I started. What are the toilers? Lori's eyes glazed over and his jaw set. The toilers work, he said. They work tirelessly for the king, and they follow the oracle, and they resent the air. It's an endless, unforgiving system, and it's one where they're never rewarded, and they're never good enough. Not enough toilers can't support the weight of their king, and too many toilers trip over their own ferocity and incompetence faster than a tree falling in a hurricane. He shook his head. It's real cruel for those rats, you know. Real cruel. I blinked. How do you know all this? I asked. Lori refocused his vision and turned his head back towards me. He smirked a little bit and chucked the rock in the water. It's all speculation, he responded. I nodded and we sat in silence for a little while. Do you want to see it? See what? The Rat King. In the sewer. I raised my eyebrows. Reckon it's still there? I asked. Lori smiled. 
I know it is, he said. A system with that many toilers can't get very far. Want to check it out? I was thinking of asking Alfie and Miranda. I scoffed. What, Miranda Carlyle? I asked. Lori froze. There was a little line between his eyebrows, showing that he was deep in thought. Suddenly, a clarity flashed over his eyes and he grinned. I was gonna say Miranda George, he said. But, yeah, let's ask Miranda Carlyle too. You know, Alfie is nuts about her. I frowned. Miranda Carlyle was a girl that went to our school. She came from a very old money family, the type that could not only afford to weave around the buoys, but drive completely past them. As an underclassman, she was definitely at the top of the social ladder. She had a ton of friends, a good boyfriend, head cheerleader. Her grades weren't the best, but she was successful enough everywhere else to coast. At the last football game of our junior year, though, she made a mistake. During halftime, she was standing at the top of the pyramid. Instead of cheering like she was supposed to, she looked out at the crowd. The lights refused to let her hide anything about herself. She was pale, with sweat dripping down her face, and her knees were shaking worse than anything I'd seen before. After a couple seconds of silence, she vomited and her legs buckled under her, leading to her crashing straight into the turf. Her ankle was twisted something awful for a while, so she had a reason not to cheer, but when she didn't rejoin the team after she was healed, it was assumed that she wasn't welcome back. The girl below her on the pyramid even spread a rumor that she backed one out when she vomited. She didn't, of course, as we could all see what happened, but it was funnier to imagine and believe that she had. Since the rumor spread, she didn't really spend any time with her old friends or her boyfriend. By the time senior year came, you could usually see her wandering around, pale, tired, and lethargic. The general consensus was that she brought it upon herself. Would Carlisle even join us? I asked. I was kind of uncomfortable around her. It wasn't like I came up with any of the rumors, but I laughed at them and told them to my friends. It was awkward to come face to face with something you had a part in ruining. Lori shrugged. It's not like she's got anything better to do, he said with a snort. He then laid back on the dock and sighed, holding up his hands to count. Okay, so it'll be us two, then Miranda Carlyle and Miranda George, Alfie Franklin, and... He held six fingers up, but seemed to be struggling with who else to invite. Wait, isn't Miranda George dating Dennis Newman? Let's invite him. Why? I dunno. He's strong, that might be helpful. We decided to stop at Miranda Carlyle's place first, as she lived closest to the docks. Her house was massive, with Corinthian columns holding up the foundation above the front porch. The door had one of those heavy brass door knockers on it. It was shaped like a sad cat holding a ring in its mouth. I leaned against a pillar close to the door while Lori let the knocker fall on the door three times over. A minute or so passed, then the door opened. A tall, broad man with a pressed suit and clean hair answered the door. He looked down at the two of us, refusing to speak first. Lori looked over at me, a nervous smile on his face. I eyed him and jerked my chin towards the man. Lori turned back to him. Hey, he said. Is Miranda here? We're some friends from school. The man said nothing before inhaling deeply and crossing his arms. My daughter has a taste for dirt, he said. How fitting. Neither Lori nor I had anything to say. The man propped the door open with a vase and turned to walk up the winding staircase behind him. Lori exhaled and turned around. Barrel of laughs, huh? He said. I chuckled breathlessly and shook my head. We waited for a moment before seeing Miranda descend down the stairs. She was wearing dirty white overalls and a brown fisherman's sweater. Once she stood in front of us, she clutched her elbow and looked down at our shoes. She had tired eyes, sunken and slightly red. What, she said flatly. Her voice was quiet. She wasn't annoyed, but she wasn't curious either. I stepped closer to the door. You know us, right? I asked. 
She nodded slightly, still refusing to look at us. I swallowed and started fidgeting with my hands. We're hanging out with a couple people today, Lori broke in. He didn't seem nearly as uncomfortable as I was. Do you want to join us? Miranda looked up. She narrowed her eyes and looked between us. Why, she asked. I opened my mouth, but no answer came out. Lori didn't have that issue. What, you got big plans or something? He said. There was a lighthearted tone to his voice, but there was also a blunt venom that he made quite apparent. Miranda's eyes widened for a split second before she directed her vision back down and reached backwards to close the door behind her. Lori smiled in his victorious, self-satisfied kind of way. I glanced at the sad cat door knocker. Are you going to let your parents know you're leaving? I asked. Miranda made a small motion with her head that suggested it wasn't necessary. She followed about a foot behind us on our walk to Alfie Franklin's place, hands deep in her pockets, neck almost retracted into the collar of her sweater, like a tortoise waiting to die. We often gave Alfie guff for having a hot mom. It bothered him when we called her hot, which was why we did it so often. She was very tall, with long hair the same shade of strawberry blonde that Alfie's was. She smiled like a model and had the posture of a movie star. She gave us that pageant winner smile as she led us into her tiny house, with the stairs right against the wall that the kitchen table was at the other side of. She rested her arm on the banister. Her expression gave me the sort of impression of an apology. Alfie's just upstairs, she said. He's working on a portrait for his art class. Did you know that he's very good at art? She had a habit of saying, did you know, before telling us any facts about herself or Alfie. She could easily tell us without any pretense, but she seemed to be the type of woman who would regret to repeat anything we had already heard. Yes, ma'am. Lori said. He leaned in the doorway with his hands in his pockets, chin tilted up like he thought he was capable of picking up someone like Miss Franklin. She placed her hand over her heart. He's been working extra shifts at the general store so he could buy the best oil paints. He says they're hard to use, but I know he'll put out something beautiful. He always does, my Alfie. Did you know he likes to do sketches of folks on television? We'll be watching Wagon Train, and he'll sit right in front of the TV and do those, gosh, what does he call them? Crookies? Crookies drawings, I think they are. And he also, she was quickly interrupted by the sound of shoes bounding downstairs, followed by Alfie leaning his body over the railing so that his eyes were level with his mother's. Crookies, mom, he corrected. Crookies. What's going on? I ran my eyes over Alfie. He was a scrawny guy, shorter than me, Lori, and Miranda even. He had these thick glasses with circle frames and a splattering of freckles all over his face like a tight gathering of stars. His cuticles were always caked with dried blood, picked and worried over constantly. He was a good guy, but he was the kind of guy you always felt bad for, even if he didn't want to pity. Miss Franklin gave her son a warm smile and gestured to the three of us. Your friends are going out today, she told him. They wanted to see if you could join them. Alfie stepped down the stairs and frowned when he saw Lori and I. He opened his mouth, probably ready with an excuse, before his eyes met Miranda's. A rosy color flushed over his cheeks and his mouth twisted into something resembling a smile. W-H-E, his voice cracked. He cleared his throat and wrapped his fist against his chest. Where are you guys going? Lori shrugged. Out and about, he said. Alfie bit his tongue and looked between Lori and Miranda, already dragging his fingernails across his cuticle skin. Choosing between avoiding a friend that made him feel like garbage and a girl that wouldn't hang out with him under any other circumstances was a predicament. Eventually, the latter seemed to weigh out the former as he took a wad of cash from his pocket and handed it to his mother. I don't know what you were planning on doing for dinner, he said. I was planning on getting us something tonight. But you can hold on to this if you want to get something for yourself. Miss Franklin took the bills wordlessly and wrapped Alfie up in a tight hug. 
His arms froze for a moment, and his eyes darted between the three of us before he avoided looking at us and patted his mom lightly on her shoulders. After what felt like an eternity, she let go. Have fun, kids, she said, waving to us as we exited the shrunken home that was the Franklin residence. The door slammed behind us, and once we were a few feet away, Lori let out a low whistle. Your mom is a smoke show, dude, he said. Alfie went pale and glanced up at Miranda. I don't think he noticed that Miranda was anywhere else, kicking pebbles along the sidewalk. Shut, 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 Alfie had a habit of stuttering when he was caught off guard. He described it to me once, he knew what he needed to say, but his body hadn't caught up with his head. It was like listening to a record skip when you know exactly what the lyric is and what it needs to sound like. Stuttering is all anticipation, and it's infuriating to keep skipping over when you have everything prepared in your head. He would get so angry with himself. Shut, 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 Lori imitated in a sing-song tone. Alfie continued to stutter before coming to a stop, standing still with his hands pressed to his forehead and his eyes shut tightly. He had to get his focus back, and Lori took that as an opportunity to pounce. Al -al 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 Alfie C.A. can, can, can't talk. He mocked loudly. Alfie grabbed at chunks of his hair, his grip tightening as he tried desperately to come back to earth. Lori snorted and slapped him on the back. Alfie stumbled forward, eyes opening, finally catching up with himself. He returned to scratching his cuticles. Come on, man, Lori said. Take it easy. It's like you think everyone's out to get you. So, it's a bunch of rats? Miranda George said. Dennis Newman had his arm slung over her shoulder. He was a tall, muscular guy with a crew cut and dull-looking eyes. He hadn't said anything the entire time we had been together. The six of us were walking down Murray Street, about five blocks away from Lori's place. Houses like his and George's were nicer than Alfie's, but not by much. Still, Lori was the type to rub it in. I remember in sixth grade, Alfie and I spent the night at his place, and Lori kept saying stuff like, I bet it's weird to not be sleeping in a futon tonight, huh Alfie? It's more than a bunch of rats, Lori said. It's a hierarchy, all permanently tied together. It's way cool. He turned around and bent over to leer at George. She was just a little over five feet tall. What? You scared? George shoved Lori's face away and huddled closer to Dennis. I'm not scared, she insisted. I just think it's dumb. Like, how much entertainment can you get out of looking at a bunch of rats tied together? They're just gonna die soon, anyway. I think it's interesting because of why they're about to die, Alfie said. He was walking along the curb, arms raised in a martyr position with his legs wandering far apart each time he took a step. It sounds like they're all parasitic on one another. The king feeds off of the labor of the toilers, the toilers feed off of the direction of the oracle, and the air feeds off of the affection of the king. None of them serve as a beneficiary for anything, so death isn't natural. They're just working themselves towards it, and it's all the more saddening when you realize they don't even know it. He hopped off the curb. It's like when an ant loses the pheromones of the one in front of it, thus leading all of the ants into a death spiral. It's rare, but... What does the oracle feed off of? Carlyle said quietly. We all looked back at her. She had been following silently for the entire duration of our trip, only offering small nods or head shakes when we spoke to her. Apparently, Alfie was interesting enough to warrant a response. He was just as surprised as the rest of us. He froze for a second before looking down at the pavement and continuing. Um, he started. Carlyle stared at him patient maybe the protection from the air he looked back up at carlisle she raised her eyebrow slightly which he took as an invitation to keep going it's like the air and the oracle are really the most similar they're both pretty frail and weak in their own respects but still powerful the main difference is that the air is favored by the king so i think that if you've got an end with the air you've got an end with the king so the oracle probably clings to the air for safety, even if the air doesn't notice. He exhaled and looked to the front of the group. 
I don't know. Is that anything, Lori? Lori didn't do anything to acknowledge Alfie's theory. He was too busy waving Georgia's hair tie above her head. Alfie frowned and tensed his shoulders. I think that's probably right, Alfie, I broke in quickly. You're really perceptive about this stuff. He looked up at me. I gave him a subtle thumbs up, not wanting to embarrass him in front of Carlisle, if she was even paying any attention. He smiled a little and returned his gaze to the sky. A few minutes passed with Lori teasing George, and Alfie slowly and unsubtle meandering closer to Carlisle. If she noticed, she didn't make a show of it. At one point, she placed her hands at the nape of her neck and pulled her hair out of her sweater. It was shiny and stringy without any lift to it. She pinched a strand, stared at it for a moment, then looked over to George. Hey, do you have an extra hair tie? She asked her. George opened her mouth, but Lori quickly interrupted her and walked over to Carlisle, hair tie already in hand. I gotcha, Lori said. I was already wearing that one, you dink, George called back to him loudly. He ignored her. Carlisle took the tie and wrapped it loosely in her hair. Chunks and strands worked their way out to fall and frame her face. Lori studied her for a second before cocking his head. Hey, I've got a question, he asked. Carlisle did nothing to respond, as she usually did. Lori decided to continue anyway. Cheerleaders have to wear hair ties when they perform, right? Yeah, Carlisle answered. Unless their hair is too short. When Misty Crawford came back from France with a pixie cut, she switched over to wearing a headband with a bow on it. Interesting, Lori replied, holding a hand to his chin in an inquisitive way. Obviously, he didn't care about any of the extra information. Interesting. I've got another question. Carlisle nodded this time. She seemed to have brightened incrementally at the prospect of someone taking an interest in one of her former passions. Lori grinned. If you had your hair up that night when you puked, how come you still got vomit in your hair? Carlisle stopped walking. Her eyes became wide and glazed over, and her arms stiffened as she sucked her lips in. Lori folded his hands at his torso and looked at her, waiting for an answer. He wouldn't let up until she said anything. Her shoulders raised up to her red ears and her eyes began to squint, the wall of tears filling up until the surface tension threatened to break. She grit her teeth, cleared her throat, and looked down at the concrete. Lori scoffed and held his hands up. Whoa, whoa, I was just asking a question. He said. When she didn't reply, he threw his arms up and laughed lightly. Geez, what did I do? Literally all I did was ask you a question. That's it. It's not like I'm asking for much. God. He turned around and continued to walk Carlisle didn't move. I looked between the two and stuffed my hands deep in my pockets. I knew Lori would call me out the second I intervened. Same with George and Dennis. We weren't any better. We had all made jokes about what happened with Carlisle. I remember making one that just about killed Lori. We were walking to the football field for a gym class when I saw a sign that said in no waste. Respect the field. I pointed to it, looked at Lori, and said that's why they didn't let Miranda Carlisle back onto the cheer squad. It was when Carlisle started sniffling that Alfie walked up to her. He glared at Lori for a split second before realizing that wouldn't do anything. He turned back to Carlisle and slowly placed a hand on her elbow. She didn't respond, so he looked back to the four of us. We'll catch up with you guys in a second, he said. His voice was flat and disappointed. Lori had already started walking away, and George and Dennis followed. I hesitated for a moment before following the two. Alfie was turned face to face with Carlisle, one hand on her arm consolingly. Hey, hey. It's all right, I heard him say. He was speaking softly, much more calm than I would have expected him to be. It's okay. You didn't do anything wrong, all right? It'll be okay. Lori emerged from his garage carrying a flashlight, a crowbar, and a bunch of shoestrings tied together. George and Dennis were sitting in the grass next to his driveway, leaning against each other looking bored. 
Alfie and Carlisle had caught up with us about ten minutes after we separated, Carlisle looking annoyed now as opposed to saddened. She clutched tightly onto her elbows, glaring at Lori as he looked over each of the objects in his hands. All right, he said to all of us. I'll open the manhole, then we can go down the ladder. Once we're down there, I don't want anyone to get lost, so we're going to tie this through all of our belt loops. He held the long shoestring up in the air. George groaned. Oh, come on, she said. That's so dumb, dude. We're not going to get lost. A stony expression came over Lori. When my brother saw the king, he said. He freaked out and ran in the opposite direction. It took me an hour to find him. I had to rely on anything I heard that could have possibly been his voice. Of course, I convinced myself that I heard things that weren't really there. Once I found him, he was covered in waste, cowering in a damp underpass with water up to his knees. I never wanted to see someone I loved go through that. He crossed his arms. I apologize if I'm inconveniencing you all by worrying about your safety, but those kinds of precautions are important to me. Without waiting for a response, Lori cut through the five of us and walked toward the manhole. We all looked at each other before trailing right behind him. He wrenched the crowbar under the manhole cover, straining loudly to lift it. Dennis nudged him over and picked up the crowbar for himself, proceeding to lift the cover without effort. Lori grinned and clapped him on the back. I knew it was a good idea to bring you along, Dennis, he said. He moved forward, the first to embark down the ladder. Dennis rolled his eyes and followed. The smell of the sewer was dense, almost thick enough to taste. George gagged and covered her mouth. The condensation clung to every surface and dripped above us. I pressed a finger into the grout between the brick. The grout pushed in with no resistance, as if the bricks had just been laid. My nose wrinkled. Lori clapped and turned around to face us. Okay, he said. I'm going to tie us all together now. He threaded the shoelace through one of his belt loops, then turning the lace back around and threading it through one more time. He tested the give before gesturing for me to come over. It was me, then Alfie, then George, then Dennis and Carlisle. Once he got to Carlisle, he dropped the lace in the dirty water we were standing in. He brought a hand to his mouth in feigned surprise before picking it back up and threading it through her overalls without hesitation. He then patted her on the shoulder with his dirty hand. Alfie and I had plenty of space, but it was almost like Lori made a point to have Carlisle, Dennis, and George in each other's space. George had to raise her arms above her head so that she could turn in order for her shoulders to not be wedged tightly between Dennis's chest and Alfie's back. I figured that Lori just didn't think ahead on how long the shoestring would be. I felt bad hearing the four shuffled behind me as we walked on the edge of the stone above the sewage. It was slippery below us, caked in wet moss and slime. We could hear the skittering of rats and vermin all around us, but never seeing anything. I remembered in elementary school, during the weather unit in science class, we learned that humidity was the volume of moisture in the air. If humidity was at 20%, it was kind of warm and sticky outside. If humidity was at 100%, the water in the air was condensed enough to drop as a liquid and begin raining. After learning that, I began to subconsciously calculate the percentage of moisture on humid days. The sewer, I decided, was at 99%. It felt damp, hot, and about seconds away from drenching us in waste and water. I could tell that almost everyone felt the same way, though not in so many words. It was probably harder for the four in the back being so close together. Poor Carlisle was in that heavy sweater. I would have given anything to be at the docks, in the dry sunlight, bare skin just feet away from miles and miles of cool water. I dragged the back of my wrist against my forehead. It did nothing to remove the sweat. How far in did you and your brother see the king, Lori? I asked. Lori looked over his shoulder with a mischievous gleam in his eyes. Like, half a mile farther, he said. There's kind of, like, a clearing or an area where we can all stand without being single file like this. Judging by how well the king was organized, it couldn't have gotten far. 
Half a mile's not bad, Dennis chimed in. I looked behind me. He had his arms slung over George's shoulders, who was holding onto his hands and staring forward, bored and annoyed. I didn't know how they could bear being so close to one another in this kind of humidity. Coach Miller always makes us run a mile if we don't do our drills well. Did they do that with the football players, Miranda? Lori shouted back to Carlisle. She was staring forward with wide eyes, looking in the direction of the tunnels in the distance. Lori frowned. Hey, Carlisle. She snapped to attention quickly and looked back at Lori. What is it? She asked. Lori made a big show of rolling his eyes and looking away. Whatever, he said. If you can't be bothered to respond, I don't know why I even bother asking. He was wondering if the football team ever had to run as a punishment, Alfie interjected quickly. Oh, um, yeah, she answered. Yeah, all the time. Samson Waugh, my ex, always had to run a lot. He didn't mind, though. He kinda enjoyed the stuff everyone else hated. But he still drew the line at you soiling yourself, huh? Lori said. That really sucks for you. Carlyle's mouth twisted up for a moment before falling into a frown. She redirected her vision towards the tunnels, and her eyes refocused. We walked for what had to be an hour. It was almost silent, save for Dennis and George talking to each other on occasion, at which Lori would jump in uninvited. I got the feeling that everybody was pretty annoyed with him. We would offer short responses to any of his questions, or no response at all. I was looking forward to the prospect of getting together with everybody except for Lori on Monday and complaining about him. Especially Alfie. It was a lot of fun to hear Alfie getting annoyed about stuff. Eventually, we found that the path we were sidling along had widened enough to accommodate all of us before coming to a dead stop just a few feet away from one of the larger tunnels. It was a massive widening above the dirtiest waterfall I had ever seen. I wasn't sure how deep it went, but I didn't want to risk walking along the slick curvature to check. Carlyle was boring holes into the water with her eyes. Lori came to a stop. We all curved around, forming a C-shape around his object of interest. He was without comment, for which we were all grateful, choosing instead to beam. It was sincere glee, an expression on his face I hadn't seen in years. He shook his head and cupped his cheeks in his hands. Wow, he whispered, awestruck. Hesitant, I followed his gaze. At first glance, it appeared to be a dead rat with clumps of fur attached by stringy clumps of baseball chew. I wish that was what it was. The rat was about as big as my forearm, fat and stiff, with matted hair slicked down in places with waste, clumped with dirt and others. His tail looked like it could snap off, bent up towards his chest. I don't know how I imagined the other rats to connect. Tails tied together in even slipknots, going up and down the king's tail like a ladder. That wasn't it at all. It was a tangled web of muddled pink, knotted and hardened from the harsh weathering of time. I felt the worst for the rats who were tied so close to the base of their tails. Part of me was glad that none of the rats were alive, as I wouldn't have to see the tails squirming together as one live, wriggling mass, caked in slime. There was no hostility anymore, though. As awful as it was, it was peaceful. The king had about five subjects, all in close proximity, gathered right next to his chest. He seemed more apparent than a ruler. His last choice was to keep his children warm, even if he couldn't keep them alive. We stared at it for a while. I had several questions. How did they die? Why would the king keep them safe? Were they still alive when you left them? I didn't ask. I felt that Lori's answers would somehow sully the moment's serenity. He would do something untoward to ridicule the circumstances of their death. I didn't think that they deserved that. Good thing the bugs haven't gotten to them yet, Lori finally said. I groaned and tore my eyes away. Lori squatted down and poked at the king's stomach. He must have passed a few hours after I left yesterday. I figured as much. George leaned into Dennis, who held her shoulder tightly. I couldn't tell what Alfie was thinking. His face was calm and sad. 
Eventually he closed his eyes, breathed in, and stared at the ceiling. The only one not paying attention to the king was Carlyle. She looked at it for a moment before redirecting her attention back to the water. She turned slightly and walked in the opposite direction, pulling Dennis, George, and Alfie closer to the edge. She pushed Dennis a bit away from her, allowing her more give on the shoelace before squatting down by the edge of the water. I cocked my head and looked in her direction. She was hunched over something, like a clump of wet fur resting at the top of the water. I inched over closer. Hey, Carlyle, W.H. I stopped instantly, mouth open, when I realized what she was looking at. My blood turned into ice and ran down my spine, tightening my shoulders to the point where I couldn't remember how they must have felt relaxed. With his hands clutching tightly onto the slick stone just above the water, big green eyes looking at Carlisle, Lori's little brother was submerged up to his chin in the sewer. There were streaks of waste down his face, slime in his hair. His nails were caked with dirt, gripping onto the stone with wild desperation. I can imagine he didn't have the strength to pull himself up. He looked between the six of us, absolutely terrified once his eyes met Lori's. He gasped, mouth instantly filling with sewer water before he hacked and spit it out. I'm sorry, he said quietly. His voice was hoarse and rushed. I'm sorry I couldn't play Rat King with you, Lori. I'm sorry. His eyes welled up. Please, Lori. It smells so bad down here, and I don't know how to get out. Please, Lori. Hiccuping sobs bounced off the wall as he shook his head fervently. Water splashed onto Carlisle's overalls. Please, Lori. I don't want to be stuck down here forever. I want to see Mom and Dad. Please. We turned our heads slowly to look at Lori. He was stone-faced and grim. His hands were in tight fists at his sides. Wordlessly, he crossed over to Alfie and took his glasses off. Alfie was too shocked to respond, and as soon as Lori was sure that he couldn't see, he tossed the glasses into the water and stomped on the ground, crushing sand beneath his shoe to mimic the sound of broken glass. Alfie gaped and began to stumble forward, which Lori expected. He placed his leg out, effectively tripping Alfie. Alfie scrambled around on all fours, searching desperately for his glasses. Lori hooped in excitement, clasping his hands together. Look at him go! He shouted, pointing. Alfie searched quicker, beginning to hyperventilate. Ah, look! He thinks he's people. Were those so expensive? Did mommy spend all her alimony on those? Dude, what the hell is your problem? Carlisle barked. Alfie began to cry. I'm, 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 I'm sore, 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 sore. He struggled in between breaths to speak. I wanted to lean down and tell him no. Carlisle isn't mad at you. She's mad at Lori, who just threw your glasses. You're not going to find them on the ground, so let's focus on getting this middle schooler out of the water. But I couldn't say any of that. All I could do was watch everything in front of me. Lori's little brother was still sobbing. Alfie was panicking. George and Dennis were freaking out. And Lori was the happiest I had ever seen him. He looked down at his brother. You know, this is exactly what you couldn't understand, he said, stepping closer to him. His feet were inches away from his fingers. The best oracles are the weak ones who don't have anything to rely on. I put you in the water because I thought you could be a good oracle, but apparently you can't even do that. He leaned down and pointed at his brother. The best oracles abandon everything to lead their followers and help their king. That could have been you. But I had to bring in Alfie Franklin of all people. He snorted. And now you want me to help you? He leaned away. You should be so lucky. With that, he stepped on his brother's fingers. He let go of the ledge, almost immediately carried towards the tunnel by a rush of water. I ran over to the edge of the ledge and leaned over, just barely grasping onto his wrist. It was slippery, and I knew I wouldn't be able to hold onto him for long. I looked back at Lori, who was still panting from the adrenaline. I couldn't express my anger well enough, so I just screamed and slammed my hand into the stone. He grinned at me. 
Dude. I screamed. What was your plan here? Drag your friends down to the sewer to play out your little fantasy? There's no such thing as a rat hierarchy, Lori. Those rats didn't have rankings, they were just scared and confused, and they died together. They died in the comfort of one another, and I don't know how stupid you have to be to see that and still think it was a monarchy. So, what, Alfie was gonna be your oracle and everyone else would be your subjects? Well, look what you're missing. I swept out my arm and gestured towards all of us. You don't have an heir, Lori. Because none of U.S. can stand you. Lori's smile flickered as he panted. A crease formed in his brow. W.H. He took a second to catch his breath. What do you mean? You're my friend. I gripped my teeth and shook my head. Lori, I said. Today you have proven, beyond a shadow of a doubt, how little I want to be around you. Every second you've spoken today has made me want to get farther and farther away from you. You, you, you're asinine and mean, and my hand shook, and I pointed at his brother. I mean, Jesus, dude. What the hell is wrong with you? Lori sucked his lips in, tucking them behind his teeth. His eyes were narrowed as he thought. He couldn't wrap his head around what I had told him. But, he said, holding his hands up. But you were supposed to be the heir. You were going to be the heir. I let out a breathless laugh. What makes you think I would want to be the heir? Hurt crossed over Lori's face. His breathing wasn't as heavy anymore. It seemed, for a moment, that he wasn't breathing at all. However, that vulnerability passed within seconds. Within seconds, his face had darkened. Within seconds, he puffed his chest out and began walking towards me. Within seconds, any hint of hesitation or restraint was dead, and my limbs began to stiffen. He stood right above me, eyes almost gleaming in the dark of the sewer. His fists tightened at his side. Who said you have a choice? He spoke. I didn't think when he lunged at me. All I could do was move. I swung Lori's brother around the corner of the ledge and lay flat on my stomach, feeling Lori's feet hit my torso, followed by his shins, followed by an absence of weight. I grasped desperately for Lori's brother's other arm and pulled him over, only then feeling a tugging at my torso. Lori was being pulled by the current. By God was he being pulled. The forces of nature were working violently against him, taking him by the legs and yanking him until his spine stretched to the point of splitting. He was breathing heavily, holding onto the feeble shoelace and looking at me, begging without words. I'd like to say I didn't think. I'd like to say that the shoelace broke on its own, and I didn't scuff it against the sharp edge of the stone. I'd like to say that I reached out after Lori when he was carried into the tunnel and down the waterfall. I'd like to say that he went out like a cool current, and that water wasn't so forceful. I'd love to say that he wasn't taken in like a bird being sucked into a jet engine, like a dying star being consumed by a black hole. I'd love more than anything to say all of those things, but I can't, and that's something I have to live with. I stood there for too long. I'm not sure if I breathed. Eventually, I turned around to see five pairs of eyes on me. I shook my head as emotion filled my throat. I swallowed it back and spoke before it could rise again. I'm sorry, I croaked. They gradually looked away from me, past me, towards the tunnels. I took in a shuddering breath and stared down at my hands. I'm sorry, 